here now we have a very special person with us i think i watched his interview now probably about two or three months ago now um uh, with abdullah samir and i could not help but notice the stark similarities between pakistan and malaysia and you know how there are always people say that you know oh but look at malaysia look at turkey look at these other countries they're not as bad as iran or pakistan or afghanistan well like it seems like that's the inevitable goal of islam to make every country as bad as iran or afghanistan or because pakistan wasn't like that either so there's so many similarities so we have special guests with us Farouz, and i think that's what i noticed when i was listening to his story so there are multiple elements that cup couple of elements in that and obviously Nuria will run this as well and uh, we'll see how it go but our format doesn't allow a detailed interview but you can I'll bring up Abdullah Samir's interview where it's a long detailed interview and you can um, hear both aspects of that on his channel um, one is obviously his own personal story and the other one is obviously how he sees Malaysia how Islam is um, impacting Malaysia um, yeah, I think we hi Farouz how are insights. you hello yeah. Hello, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you so yes. much for being with us. First of all, are you better now? Are you feeling uh, good? Yeah. After after a month, uh, we we feeling better. Actually, we got COVID for the whole family. Oh. And then uh, we got twice. We got the subside, and then it came back again. You know, in in Sweden right now, the corona is going higher and higher. Depends to the municipalities. Right. So my daughter is going to, you know, preschool. She, she got mm -hmm. it from there. I got spread to the family. And then, you know, at that point of time, I got a denial from the migration. It's like super, super difficult. And yeah. then with the paperwork and everything. So, yes, right now uh, we are feeling better. It's recovering. Okay, it's good. good. I'm very, yeah. very glad to hear that. Um, yeah. So, Feroz, thank you for being here with us today. Obviously, as Horace said, you did an interview, an in-depth interview with Abdullah Samir, which mm. I've had the pleasure to watch as well. And I got a lot of insights into your story. But as you said, like you're in quite a, a strange predicament at the moment mm. just because of like your experience and what that's led to. So if you could just run us through, like, you know, obviously the fact that you officially renounced Islam in Malaysia and then mm. the thing, just uh, like really quickly, if you can talk us through what happened there and then what you're currently facing in Sweden now, mm. um, because we do want to highlight the plight of ex-Muslims as well and mm. the things that mm. you have to go through, con considering that you're, you know, with your wife being a Christian and you having a child mm. as well, it kind mm. of further complicates things. So yeah, the, the floor mm. is yours. Yes. So you see, like, uh, to summary all this, I have been interviewed by uh, Samir Abdullah. So you see, I born as Islam. And okay, my parents, my parents are basically they're Muslims. So from from ba from the roots itself, I'm a born as Muslim. Okay. The Malaysian legislation we call that a hybrid legislation. So we have civil law and Sharia law. Okay. So people, we have like uh, roughly like millions of people, like 24 million citizens. So 71 percent is the Muslims. Imagine that. So in 71%, I'm, I'm one of the person who goes to the Sharia law, law, I mean, to the court and says that I don't want to become a Muslim. And then the problem is because according to the Malaysian law, there is no way if you're born as an Islam, you can become an atheist or you can become non-Muslim. You can't do that. If you choose or opted to go that, you have to face a very long trial or sometimes without trial and all the punishment. The punishment can be various, you know, like, five years jail, three years jail, and then sometimes you go missing. Many people go missing. My friend goes missing. Until now, we don't know that person. So I'm, I can say I'm the luckiest one managed to flit out. And then yeah. now, the problem is because the authority is too powerful in Malaysia, for them to shut me down is very easy. You know, They use police, they use all the authority. So how, you, how I mentioned in the interview itself. So basically, if you ask me, I born as a Muslim, I want to become an atheist, but in Malaysia they don't allow me because atheist is haram in Malaysia. So you yeah. be a Muslim, you need to die as a Muslim. So I fled to Sweden. When I come to Sweden, it's another Sharia system is running here. <laughs> you know, you know, the Swedish government is more on, you know, friendly Muslim terms. When you talk about atheist or whatever, they're like, oh, we're not interested. You know, this is different. Yeah. So it's very tough uh, in the situation. 
but yes, we are, we are actually sorting things out as well. But right now I'm still in Sweden, you know. So yeah. Mm. So this is like so just summary. just to clarify, there's no way in Malaysia that you could officially drop your Muslim status, right? According no, to the current no. like, because the Sharia legal system always almost works parallel to the civil legal system. Is that correct? Okay, like in Malaysia, the civil and the Sharia, they they goes together. But when it comes to religion, they are not in the same terms. So the right. Sharia always wins. You understand? For example, if yeah. I born as a Muslim, I automatically falls under the Sharia law. If I go to the civil law and say that, you know, the, the Sharia police is beating me, they say, sorry, it's not under our legislation. Go back there. This is how they work. Right. Okay. And um, obviously, then you would like, as you're saying, you're lucky enough to have fled, um, which yes. was a whole thing in itself, because I, I remember from your interview, you were saying that they actually tried conversion therapy and, and like mm. really went to extremes. So, yes. um, and now, uh, the, I guess the most shocking part, even though that's horrific in itself, but the most shocking part is, as you're saying, the reaction now from the Swedish government, mm. right? And how and how they're kind of encouraging you to go back to Malaysia, where you are understood mm. to be at in grave danger. Mm. Yes, like you see, like the Swedish, the Swedish, you know, the Swedish government does not look all this. For them, it's like, okay, you're born as a Muslim. That's your problem. That's not my problem. Okay, if you wish yeah. to renounce religion, that's a problem. But in case you're Muslim or someone, atheist, is beating you or prosecuting you, yes, please, come and tell us. We are more a Muslim-friendly country. That's what's happening right now. If you're my colleague, one of my colleagues, if you know, uh, what's that, um, you know, uh, Muhammad Amara. So, you know, skeptic Muhammad right now facing the same problem like me as well. We're both in the same yeah. picture right now. You know, yeah, the we person, interviewed him too. Exactly. So, the, the basically... The problem is our case has been re uh, reviewed by the Muslim itself. Imagine I was prosecuted by the Muslim. The case has been given to another Muslim person in Sweden. How the case will be evaluated? Yeah. Are these, the, are these the, your legal representatives that you're talking about? They've both been Muslim? No, my legal representative is, uh, they are, they are, they are basically, they are atheist. You know, they are, okay. they are like Swedish. But the case officer in the immigration department is Muslim. Right. I, I'll tell you, uh, it, it's sad and funny at the same time, but the uh, if you remember the guy who was on Egyptian TV uh, who, who was talking about his atheism, this happened a few years ago and Sam Harris was noticed and then he fled to Germany. All he said something like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm no longer a Muslim and he was just mm. promoting atheism live on TV. So he fled to Germany when I, when I was in Germany in 2019, I think I met him. And he was, he told me the same thing that um, his person who was looking after his case was a Muslim. Mm. And he was, you know, like, uh, the, the, and I think it was initially rejected. And then later on, it was uh, uh, accepted. And then he couldn't even talk about it. And mm. I, I was there in the thick of it at that point. I, th mm. I think he did end up getting his German citizenship. I'm not sure yet. But yeah, mm -hmm. it happens quite a lot. Like, for uh, example, uh, yeah, sorry, yes. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, please. Like, for example, like in my situation, the court, the Swedish court, that is the administration court, agreed that Malaysia to slap a person, to beat a person in the name of religion, like Islam, is fine. That is something that I really can't take it personally because the, the court itself agrees that it's okay for an education purpose to become an Islam to someone to slap or to educate, they say it's fine. It's a part of a process. Can you imagine how how things are changing right now in Europe, basically? Yeah, no, that that's insane. Because even I mean, for example, we saw now that the like Norway had flown the Taliban in to negotiate mm -hmm. as well. So <laughs> I don't know. The prospects of Europe are really worrying in that case. But I mean, you're you like you're here now. How what what's the what's the current status in terms of like how far along is this process? What is there still pressure from the Swedish government right now to kind of send you back? And if anything, is there anything we can do to raise our voices, potentially anyone who has contacts in that part of the world? Um, what's the mm -hmm. current status? The status right now, okay, you see, this is what the migration board tell me. Uh, my partner is working. Uh, she, she's, she's a Christian, so she's working. So basically, we have another last option to get a working permit. So it means in Sweden, if your partner is working, so you be can, can become an a dependent and you can stay in Sweden with your child that's fine okay yeah. but the problem is the this apostasy is no end 
we are not getting it justice. So what I have spoken to a few of the lawyers, you know, some of the lawyers, I only have two options right now. The one option for me to allow to stay in Sweden to change track from asylum to work permit for me to stay in Sweden. That is one. The second one to place the impediment. Impediment means, for example, like new circumstances raised. I cannot use the old circumstances, you know, like a processing. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can say that, oh, it's a risk for me to go back. There is something happened, but that is very minimal. It's like 0.01%. They approve it if you place an impediment. So what I have done, uh, like my partner uh, employer is more than kind enough to know all the situation. So they're kind of helping us to grant, you know, help us to sponsor through the, the work visa so that we can stay. But meanwhile, I'm planning to bring this matter to the European court at France. Okay. So that we get justice, you know, for this matter. Yeah. Because I, the Swedish migration tried to shut me down. So I'm telling that, you know, I'm go not going to leave this case like that because I have to proceed to the another level. So that is at the human rights courts. So are and you then, going to uh, the ECJ, the European Courts of Justice? Ah, uh, yes, no. that's right. Correct. Okay. That's correct. Yes, I'm going, okay. I'm going there. I still have like uh, six months, you know, uh, but right now they are shortening the time for four months application. But mine, I will okay. have like six months. So I'm hopefully by next month, I'll try to do the first submission first. Okay. So maybe we can admit this case at the court. And after that, maybe we can ask, uh, you know, any lawyer that's willing to help me or someone. The problem is right now, uh, is I'm getting very difficult. I don't have much help when it comes to, you yeah. know, like advocacy or anything. Because one is uh, many people don't understand what's happening in Malaysia. And people, when I say that, you know, Malaysia have this problem. They say, like, ah, you are lying. This is the problem. Ignorance. When I say, you know, we have this problem, look at the proof. I'm one of the living proof. I can yeah. tell you, apparently, right now, your your our guest, our people, our viewing. I can say that people say that these things is happening. The whole Malaysian government is covering up. The whole, you know, people are covering up. But the problem is, who is there to listen? So that's why, right now, if you ask me, we need support for definite. Yeah. Okay, no, no, that's great. So obviously, if anybody who is watching has contacts in that part of the world in Sweden, if you've got advocacy contacts, lawyers who are willing to work pro bono, get involved in this case with the ECJ, and then obviously we're here, we will definitely um, share what's happening with that case and kind of get some momentum behind it when you do approach the ECJ. Um, and in terms of the work permit, that route seems like it's pretty much going to be the more successful route than you saying mm -hmm. there's new circumstances, right, in your case? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right, correct. Uh, okay. And um, you said the new circumstances, for example, could have been that your life is in danger in Malaysia. Is that not already part of your initial case as well? Surely Sweden has some level of a case study that Malaysia, you know, Malaysia's view on apostates and the fact that you cannot renounce your religion officially. So has that is that case kind of has it lost its merit? What's happening with with that? You're, you're, you don't seem to kind of convinced that that element's going to work out you're focused on the work permit is that correct okay okay what happened was actually uh according to the swedish law when you place an asylum you you seek for asylum they give yeah. you a chance for you first is the level of migration board to review your case second will be administration level the third will be the the court of appeal so if this court of appeal says that they're not going to listen to this case they are not going to review this case anymore for apostasy so yeah. this is what they say in my case. They say that I have initiated the problem by myself. It means it's my decision to become an atheist or some someone, you know, who's not the one to be a Muslim. That's my problem. Wow. And Swedish, okay. Sweden is not responsible for this act. This is solely from my problem. This is what they say. It always amazes me how they, they you know, we have such a strong stance on victim blaming, you know, like if mm. someone becomes a victim in terms of murder, burglary, rape we the authorities are trained to tell them that no you know we have to be always careful in selecting our words we just can't even give an indication that you know maybe you were at the you know the the worst they could say is is you were just at the wrong place at the wrong time you know mm -hmm. but but here in these cases they say well you brought it upon yourself imagine you say that to someone who got mugged in the middle of the street or a woman yeah. who got raped or you know well you brought it upon yourself Mm -hmm. and, and and then on the other hand, the, the, their own charter of human rights that they've signed, they say that every person has uh, freedom of speech is a human right. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And then if if there are consequences, which we understand, freedom of speech can have consequences. Mm-hmm. But the least we can do is at least stand by them when people who do exercise that and do take risks. And um, and, and then, you know, when they need help, they should be helped. Anyway, carry on. I just had mm-hmm. to point that out. Yeah, yeah, and sorry, I just wanted to ask you, Feroz, is there, in terms of converting, like if, if, for example, you had to go back to Malaysia, let's say, um, mm-hmm. would t- becoming a Hindu or something like that, because as in Malaysia, you cannot be an open apostate yes. or an atheist, exactly. per se, so like, yes. would, would converting to Hinduism or mm-hmm. even, to, even in Sweden, would c- converting to Christianity help your case mm-hmm. or? No. Like, for example, like uh, you say, I have initiated, for example, in Sweden, right? I say that I want to become a free person. So for them that they say that, okay, fine, you can be a free person or whatever, but converting to Christian or whatever, it's not going to help this because Sweden yeah. is kind of uh, closing its doors right now, okay? Mm-hmm. So if, if you ask me, like, is that a good place for a seeking asylum for posters, like, for example, like ex-Muslims or atheists or some, someone else, I will never recommend Sweden. Because yeah. Sweden is giving more, how to say that, more green lights for p- people from Middle Eastern. You know, they're basically mostly are Muslims, you know, from war and country and everything. But if you ask about the supposed to see, they are the first one who are going to deport the apostasy cases because they have few tracks. This is how they work. They have few tracks, the fast track, they call them. So once they look at the case that you are opposed to see, for example, you're going out of the religion, they will mark your case as a fra- fast track. So once they mock your case as a fast track, they don't give you anything. For example, they don't look at the case, your proof or anything. They have their own system called LIFUS. So from the LIFUS system, they will see that, okay, it's your country is fine. They don't go detail. They don't see that you are, you know, there is a country with Sharia or anything. They just simply reject. Like, okay, fine. That's it. Go out. Okay, fine. You go out. Okay, you're from Malaysia. Safe country. Go out. This is how they, they, they rate. Malaysia is a safe country. There is no war. Okay, fine. Safe to go. Bye-bye. Okay, uh, uh, this country is safe to go. This is how they assess. They don't go yeah. detail. So when I make a, a demand with my lawyer, I say that my case have a proof. You know, I've been in Sharia court for eight years, gone through everything. I have a papers with me, original papers. I have my papers uh, trans- translated from the court itself in Malaysia. I prove to them everything, and the court says this. They say, this paper can be forged and lack of security. There is no reason for us to assess. That's it. Shut down. Wow. Okay. And, and like, so I'm so sorry for what you're having to deal yeah, with. I have you, I just wanted to ask you, have you considered any other countries, like you're in terms of backup plans? And, and I just wanted to ask you that in, in the worst case situation, if you had to go back to Malaysia, would kind of Hinduism or a different religion mm-hmm. ensure your safety or still not because they kind of know that you filed these papers and you tried to apostatize? For example, like, for example, right now, the problem is I even cannot be sent back because the thing is I have a child. Yeah, the child is stateless. So the okay. problem is because the child is born, born to Muslim or non-Muslim, so my child does not fall under the bucket of Muslim, either mm-hmm. bucket of non-Muslim. So that is another problem. So they cannot deport us. That's one. Another one, if we go to another country as well, we within Europe, we will fall under the, uh, under the law of Dublin law. So the Dublin law will send back us to Sweden again. So yeah. it's become a ping pong. Things will yeah. not solve. So this is what the lawyer says to me. The lawyer says, this is what the Swedish migration basically will do. Once they are not interested in your case, mostly people will go for hiding. Mm. So the lawyer says to me, probably you will go to hiding. It means if I go to hiding, what will happen to me? You know, I'm very vulnerable. That's one. Secondly, my child will become very vulnerable. If I go to hiding, it means I'm undocumented. In Sweden. You need school and yeah, and you need employment and all those challenges are there. Exactly. But in Sweden itself, the child can go to school. But if I was deported back in Malaysia, I will f- false back to the Sharia law again. You know, whatever. Because once your case has been posted, everything has been recorded. If you check my name with the Sharia system, my name is still there. So basically, that's what would happen. If the deportation is done, the, the sentence will be still co- carry on again. It won't stop. You know, I, I, it, it just frustrates me so much. I get it. I get it. And the refugee problems, and especially you know, in 2011 and the post, all of that. I get it. Every country is, is, is trying to do their best. But 
ex-Muslim is such a strange and clear-cut phenomena that you know how Muslims, tr how they see Islam, how they see the religion. It's different from the rest of the world. Hindus don't take in the, the Hinduism as seriously as Muslims do. Christians definitely don't. No other culture does it. So when there, when you have 12 or 13 countries, Muslim countries, where apostasy is punishable by death, the other countries, it may not be punishable by death, but the social stigma, the, the, the discrimination, the, the humiliation that you're going to get, nobody should get it. All of that, I think, and still... They're like, well, you know, it's the I, I remember there was a judgment a few years ago in Australia. There was a, there was a, the, the, there was a Bangladeshi asylum seeker, and the judge said, when after the immigration refused his uh, refugee asylum status, and the, he went to the tribunal, and the judge said, well, Bangladesh is a hu huge country, just go and disappear over there. Uh, you know, it's like. How can we actually do that? Okay, I, I get it. You're saying that that is possible. So if you just go back, change your new identity or something, I'm not, I'm not saying that's in your case, but in that person's case, if that was possible, but how, what does that say? What does it say about us? Or what, what does it say about, you know, freedom and democracy? And yeah, we love human rights. What does that say about that? Like, fair enough, you can't bring everyone from there. But the ones who are knocking on your door, at least those people, you can say, okay, we, we understand you're in a very difficult situation. You know what? We've had 10 million other refugees, the, the, the very people. And guess what? It's going to bite them in the, in the backside because, um, you know, uh, it, it's, so, it's, so, it's so frustrating. It's so upsetting. It's like uh, even the court says this to me. They said once they, you know, I have all the papers. I already been prosecuted in Malaysia. You know, I have the paperwork. I have all the documents. In my documents, clearly stated this by the court from the Sharia. They say, according to Islam, we can't provide the province for you to go out of renounce as Islam. You become an ex-Muslim, and there is no human rights can be given to you. It's clearly mentioned that if you still insist of going out, there will be prison sentence. Plus, with all this, you know, all this education, Islamic everything, it's been written and it's been stamped. So when I say this, we submitted this to the Swedish court, you know, Swedish court of justice, so-called. Yeah. And uh, they said this, they said, ah, oh, why not you retry again and go back to Kuala Lumpur and stay there? Does it bring sense? You wow. already gone there, you got persecuted, yeah. you got the order and you get everything. And the court of justice in Sweden is telling, go back there again and give a try. How does this bring sense? Yeah, look, if it's if it's anything similar to like the UK, obviously Europe has this this problem in general. We've seen what's happened when Germany opened its gates to like, you know, refugees from Islamic countries predominantly. But even in the UK, for example, like the default position, we call it the hostile environment because the default position for asylum seekers um, are, is no. And you really have to present a strong case. But usually, by and large, if you have a decent legal representative and you can prove that if you are sent back, there's current criminal charges against you um, or you're being prosecuted and your life is in danger and you could potentially have a stateless child, those right. are reasons enough for them to grant you asylum. Granted, it would take a while, but they would usually accept that because they've got case studies. When you look at Malaysia, we understand mm -hmm. that the Sharia system is operating there. You see what's mm -hmm. happening with the Orang Asli, the native people yes. of Malaysia, and all exactly. the positive discrimination that they're facing mm -hmm. by the governments incentivizing them for jobs and things just to convert to Islam and slowly yes. wants to erase their culture. You can mm -hmm. see it happening. So I'm yes. really surprised. Um, I mean, I'm not so surprised. I mean, to be honest, like Norway and Sweden and, and these European countries, are like mm. they seem to be kind of getting warming up to like Islamists more than, mm. Mm. you know, actually looking out for people who are genuinely um, persecuted like yourself. Mm. And I think the fact that they're telling you to go back over and over again or, or try again or go to a different state, it, it, sorry, is the state of Sabah also governed by Sharia? Yes, yes. We have 14 okay. states run by the same legislation. But in Sarawak, okay. Sarawak is yeah. because the majority are Christians. But still, there is an act that the government have imposed to, you know, to create a more stricter condition because in that state, it's a bit loose. So they have another new law coming in to make it more tighter. 
So basically, like where I want to go and stay, you know, people, okay, for example, like me, I find I can stay in Sweden, I can do something else. How about people are yeah. still fighting in Malaysia right now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not, yeah. And and the things that, that you've experienced while you were there when they realized mm. what you were trying to file for and what you were trying to mm. kind of do to get rid of this um, t like Muslim label in your life. Mm. There's people who are stuck in that exact situation right now who, as you said, mm. you were lucky mm. enough so you have a voice and you can speak on behalf mm. of all these people because yeah. people like Harris and I don't know exactly what's happening on the ground level in Malaysia and what the government's tactics are when people do try and make these kind of moves. So I think your voice is very, very important. And I think the last thing, besides doing whatever we can and whoever's listening and whatever we can do on social media, um, to stir up anything around your case or getting international lawyers involved in your case. Um, would you be willing to consider other countries as well, maybe Canada, um, countries like that potentially, or are you set on staying no, in Sweden? I, no, no, no. Actually, we are not like that. I'm actually op I'm open to any country. I'm fine with that. As long, one, we are safe. My child future has been safe. It's fine. And uh, as well, this this problem, this apostasy of Malaysia need to be open to everyone. People need to know that. You yeah. know, that's my demand. Like, you know, many people are even right now, people are approaching me in my, you know, private messages. They say that, hey, I have this problem. You know, I'm stuck. So I'm telling them, I'm guiding them. Don't go here. Don't go to the Sharia law. Please, under the radar, I'm advising them. So I'm saving them, kind of. You understand? So if you ask me, if you, if, if you want me to go to Canada, whatever, if they're willing to accept me, I will go. You know, who want to be in a country that they don't want me? You know, yeah. I, I'm work, okay. I, I worked as well. I paid tax. Nothing I get in return. Even for medication, for medical, I have nothing, you know, zero. Yeah. So, and so your current status, obviously, you, you said your wife is working, right? Yes, yes. Okay. All right. So I was going to I was going to ask you, because have they given you any kind of like they, they have to provide you with a certain stipend, even as an a, asylum seeker. So in, whenever you're in a position of limbo, the Swedish oh, authorities, yes. are, are they at least providing you with that? No, right now, you see, they have a very funny law. For example, if you change track from asylum seeker, if you're asylum seeker or undocumented, at least you can get something. If you're changing track to work permit, it means mm. you don't get your permit yet. You even cannot go to dental. You cannot go to any clinics as well because there is no law exists to cover us. It means if I go to the hospital, I need to pay at least 1,200 crowns from my own pocket. For example, like my child, if right now my child got sick, I have forgot my own money. And I'm paying tax. That's the best part. I'm paying tax. My wife is paying tax. And we don't get anything because this is a transition period. So so when you fall in the bucket, for example, this is how they, they how this is how the system works. There is an apple tree, they put a bucket under that. If the apple falls exactly into the bucket, you are safe. If you are outside the bucket, don't expect the bucket, they will come and pick it up for you. So basically for them it's like that's it. You need to wait. If you got the resident permit, you are safe. Okay, fine. If not, that's not our problem. You survive or you try by yourself. It's, yeah, it's very that... challenging. It's very challenging. You see, we've been prosecuted eight bloody years in Malaysia, you know, by the authorities <laughs> behind us, going to the stupid Zakir Nai Association, people coming and knocking our head every time to become a Muslim. And we survive that and come back to Sweden, go through another phase. You can you imagine how some mental state yeah, it's like this, that's... this is it's like a bloody situation whereby we have no way out and we are telling hey my Im migration of sweden you look at me i'm the one of the evidence and you are you know you are just making don't know because you know if i am a muslim i say that hey an atheist have slapped me they will say like oh really come on it's like that so this thing yeah. is the ongoing situation and malaysia is very smart of covering this matter up. That's another problem. Uh, we're gonna uh, yes. just stay in touch with us and let us know if we can, if you ever need anything like fundraising or something. We're obviously uh, very sympathetic towards your plight, and we wish you best of luck. Denver is mm -hmm. saying, "I don't understand this. Malaysia is sixty-one percent Muslim. Mm -hmm. It's not like they are ninety-nine percent. There's a huge non-Muslim population. How are they able to do this?" And I think. Um, um, Faroz explained that quite a bit in his uh, Abdullah Samir uh, conversation, um, the how, how the Malaysian system works. Um, so yeah, go do check it out, um, unless you want to just quickly comment on that as well, Faroz. 
Okay. Uh, so you see, like in Malaysia, I tell you, for example, V falls under between of these two categories. Muslim, 61% example. Actually, it's not 61, it's 71. Yeah. And we have balance, it's non Muslim. Okay. So this non Muslim have all the freedom. For example, they have freedom of education, freedom of religion, they can marry, they can have kids, they can choose their religion. It's the Muslim category whereby they themselves become a Muslim, okay? So they want to worship to Allah, they want to worship to whatever, that's their problem. And people like us does not fall under any of this problem. We fall under this between cracks. So we are the minority in, in Malaysia whereby we have been prosecuted, okay? We have no voice, we fall under the crack, and a non-Muslim cannot voice out for us, and the Muslim will not ever voice out for us. So imagine we are fighting for ourselves, and there is no one is going to voice out for us. Can be a minister, can be anyone, because we actually we don't know how many percent we are. Maybe one percent or two percent, but we are. I can say we are being discriminated. That is one. And if you ask me that, where we fall. We are between non-Muslim and Muslim. We are minority Muslim, and we must mm. die as a Muslim. So basically, like that's what's happening. If you can check my, that's what what uh, uh, Harris says. You, you need to go to my interview. That's very detailed. I, I have tell you everything what's happening and about Malaysia situation. I recommended that. Yeah, wow. thank wow. you so much, Feroz. And um, yeah, obviously, we will we'll stay in touch um, privately sure. as well and to just keep us updated on the work permit situation. And in the meantime, yep. any connections that we think will be handy, I'll also shoot them your way. But please mm. keep raising your voice for, for what's happening in Malaysia and, sure. you know, giving these insights, because I think it's crucial. We can't we can't just leave out Malaysia when we talk mm. about these countries and how they are prosecuting ex-Muslims, yep. um, especially people, as you said, who just fall between the cracks. We have to mm. speak on their behalf. Thank you so much for sharing your personal story. And so far, I just wish you all yep. the best for now. And let's stay in okay. touch. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Ferris. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Bye. Denver is saying so basically, it's a system within a system, which is true. Um, it, much, that's yeah. the kind of impression I got it. And that's exactly what Pakistan is, um, where Pakistan has ended up as well. Um, it, it didn't really start off like that. So there's so many similarities that I, when I was listening to Ferris's interview, um, I, I was getting that. I was like, "Whoa!" So, so Malaysia is where Pakistan was in the seventies, where they had these grand, grandiose ideas of how they're gonna, you know, create this modern welfare, Islamic welfare society, where they're gonna keep both modernity and Islamic values all in in one. But it just doesn't work that way. It just doesn't. It, there you know, is it's no... really sad because I've actually like when I when I lived in Malaysia, I was in Kuala Lumpur, as Feroz was saying, and we your first instinct there. Well, I was still a Muslim, but your first instinct is like beyond just Eid, um, which they call Hari Raya. They actually you get a holiday off for everything like Chinese New, New Year, Diwali, all of that. So from the outset, it looks so pluralistic. And you're like, mm. wow, you know, nobody's here kind of beating you down with a stick and telling you to convert. But the more mm. you speak to people and the more you see like the, the breakdown of neighborhoods and even the jobs people hold, it really starts to make a lot of sense. Yeah. So Malaysia is a, a really complicated one in that sense. Yeah. It's state based discrimination, isn't it? Like, I mean, 100%, how yeah. have you actually made different rules for different people just just to appease your religious sentiments it just doesn't make any sense but um, yeah, that's what we're saying religion the, yeah religion is an unnecessary evil yeah and and horace you know like just like put it up really quickly but that's a huge phenomenon what's happening imagine the very like native malays like their culture these people are actually going government officials are going into the depths of the jungle and bribing them and saying forget mm. your customs move to this place like take on islam uh, accept Islam and you'll have this amazing job and they're literally this is it's like Islam doing what Islam does best you know going in eroding your culture put forcing Islam on you and saying if you don't have Islam your your way of life is going to be absolutely shit yeah uh, she was saying don't announce apostasy costs outweigh benefits that's actually true if you're in a Muslim country well, we always say that especially in our Urdu channel as well we say your lives are important don't announce your apostasy you don't have to come out you don't have to be a hero um we like yes even though it's commendable sometimes like look what sharif gaber has achieved um but is it worth it is your life 
Yeah, and Sheriff uh, Dobber's not not in safety yet by any standards. He's not, so, he's, no, but yeah. yeah, he's yeah. I mean, that life he's, he's living a life of a fugitive in a way. Yeah. So yeah. I, I I think I'm in the Wabi said it, and I say if I was in Pakistan, I wouldn't have been doing this. I might have been living my life because I think you can go and live a decent life in Pakistan. There are underground parties and alcohol is available. You know, you, you can live your life almost. You can live your life. And it's, um, if you belong to a, you know, um, a, a, a certain uh, class. Class of family. Uh, yeah, yeah, elite but, class, basically. I would um, never be doing this if I was in, still in Dubai. No way. Are you kidding me? Like, you don't have... We, only, we, only... We, didn't, we didn't expect. No, no, no. Okay, we didn't expect that. <laughs> Okay, Denver is saying apparently Anwar Ibrahim is the cause of all the problems in Malaysia. All evidence points to him. Mahathir Muhammad is just doing the same. Mahathir, did he recover? I think he had a very serious heart attack or something. He was dying almost. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure actually. To be honest, I, I haven't know. been keeping an eye. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about But yeah, he's, he's not taking Malaysia down. And lots of people, I think most, most people there don't like him from what I hear. Mahathir or yeah. Anwar? No, Mahathir. Yeah. Yeah, he's a senile old fool. If you like these videos and want to support me in my activism, then you can support me on Patreon or PayPal. Stay free, everyone.